Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video session on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and the reason we have this video is thanks to the almost a thousand awesome people who have uh, signed up to help support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. You guys are doing an incredible amount, more than you realize, uh, to help continue making this possible, and I have some big plans coming up, some cool, exciting stuff that uh, is only possible because I have some extra funding from people like you. So. Thank you very much to everyone who contributed. I went through and asked you guys for some questions that you'd like to hear my thoughts on. I have a list of them here, and uh, let's just get right into it. The first thing I have here is from Joshua McCoy, who asks, somewhat long question, is there a systematic problem with the exposed revolver type barrel, like the Luger, the Lottie, the P-38, etc., that has resulted in them being discontinued from mainstream production? Extension, what serious benefits does the Browning type enclosed slide over uh, enclosed slide give over the exposed revolver type barrel that makes it preferable to the presumably lighter and better balanced and more accurate revolver style barrel? Uh, I think what we're the, the missing link here, uh, Joshua, that you what you're not the, the element that you're not seeing in it is the reason that Browning style systems don't have things like uh, the, the sights affixed to the barrel is that the Browning system requires the muzzle of the barrel to be controlled by the slide. So the slide has to go to the end of the barrel in order to control it as it pivots in and out of being locked. There's nothing necessarily wrong with other styles of operating mechanism, the P38, the Lottie, etc. And you point out there are a number of positive elements to them. For example, the sights being on the barrel, which gives you a better element of accuracy. The problem is the Browning style system is pretty much at this point undeniably the, the simplest and cheapest and most reliable overall combination uh, or system with this overall combination of characteristics. And that makes it the most effective for handgun manufacturers. So they go with the Browning because it has very few moving parts, it's easy to machine. When you look at something like a P38, look at the, the, the locking block inside there. And, and the corresponding elements of the frame that have to be machined around it, and then compare that to something like the inside of a 1911 or a Glock, which frankly operate basically the exact same way. Um, the Browning system is just simpler and easier to produce, and that's why most people go with it. Next up, from Robert, or Funny Farmer, uh, if you could have a world if you could give a World War I soldier stuck in muddy trench war for a modern gun anything that is or has been produced, which one would it be? This may disappoint some people, but I think my answer on that one would be an AR-15. I really think that's pretty much the best option for rifles out there today. Uh, if you want a combat rifle, the M16, the AR-15 pretty much balances. Again, everything is a balance of attributes. So. Is the AR-15 the best at everything? No, it's the best at some things, and it's generally very good at everything. It's very reliable. If, it's, if you choose to build it this way, it can be quite light. Um, certainly, it doesn't have to be very heavy unless you, again, choose elements to make it heavy. Um, they are very accurate. They're very comfortable to shoot. They really work with a shooter. Uh, and if I were going into a World War I muddy trench combat situation, I can't think of a rifle I would rather have for practical effect than an AR-15. A lot of stuff that would look cooler, I think AR-15 would get the job done the best. Next up we have Frank Dantuono. We'll just say Frank. Uh, Frank says, the Cochrane revolver. Can you get your hands on one? They say the disc revolver concept is inherently flawed, but I do not think that is the case. So if you guys aren't familiar, the, the Cochrane is an example of a turret revolver. These were made both as handguns and as rifle length guns. And the way to think about these is think of a revolver, but instead of having all of the, the cylinders parallel, think of each cylinder being like the spoke on a wheel. So you've got a vertical axis and the cylinders spinning this direction around it, bringing each chamber into line with the barrel uh, when you cock the hammer. Mechanically, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it is a little bit bulkier than a traditional style revolver, but you know not so much that it's really a problem. Um, I'm sure at some point I will get my hands on, not necessarily a Cochrane, but a variant of turret revolver at one of the auction houses, because 
they're the sort of things that are interesting and appealing to collectors, so I'm, I'm sure I'll come across one sooner or later, whether I'll be able to shoot it, I doubt it, whether I'd want to shoot it, not so sure, which leads me to the second half of this. So the problem with turret revolvers is twofold. It's partly a legit mechanical issue, and it's partly, and I think much more significantly, a psychological issue. And that issue is chain fire. So when you have a traditional percussion revolver, you always have a, a slim chance, and especially with modern guns, it's a very slim chance. But it's possible that when you strike one percussion cap, the spark from that will actually jump to an adjacent cylinder or an adjacent chamber and fire a second chamber or a third chamber as well. Now, in a traditional revolver, that's a bad thing, but it's not a catastrophic thing. Presumably, you're aiming the gun at something that you intend to shoot, and if a couple extra chambers go off and, and you shoot it more than you intended, you may damage the gun, but you're not going to hurt yourself, almost certainly, and you're probably not going to hurt anything, anyone standing around. The problem with a turret revolver is that if it chain fires, you've got the potential for balls to go in every possible direction, including directly back into the shooter. And while it was a legitimate concern that that might actually happen, I think the bigger issue for turret guns was, you know, if you have the option to buy one of those or a traditional style revolver, do you really want, how many people would really choose the one that actually stands this little tiny percent of a chance of shooting you in the face when you pull the trigger? Would you? Because I don't think I would, and I think that was the downfall of turret revolvers. Next up, from David Sharp, are there any interesting forgotten weapons that the average Joe firearms enthusiast could get his hands on for a reasonable price? If there are, are any of them worth having? Well, worth having is up to you guys, and in fact, the definition of forgotten weapons in this case is, is kind of up to interpretation. The way I would interpret it, I would say, are there any guns out there that are available, economical, cool, and generally vastly underappreciated? And I would say the answer to that is absolutely yes. Now, of course, if you're talking about experimental guns, really crazy, weird designs where they only made a couple of them, that stuff's out there, but kind of by definition, it's really expensive and rare and hard to get your hands on. So I'm not so sure there's so much of that out there, but I think there are definitely interesting guns out there that you could afford to buy if you're out buying guns that your buddies probably haven't seen and that are just kind of cool and fun and different from the standard Glock and AR that everybody has. So a couple examples of this. Um, the first one that actually jumped to mind, because I just saw one of these for sale today, are Indonesian Mannlicher M95 rifles. So a little bit of a backstory on these guys. Uh, the Dutch used an M that was actually largely made by Steyr, and they were called the M95, but they're actually a turnbolt rifle, not a straight pull. Um, Steyr and Mannlicher designed and manufactured multiple different designs in 1895, which can lead to some confusion. Anyway, the Dutch Army adopted an 1895 pattern turnbolt gun. It uses five round end block clips. They were chambered in 6.5 Dutch, of course, and these were used both in continental Europe, and they were also issued to the Dutch Colonial Army, the KNIL. Dutch had a bunch of, the Dutch had a bunch of colonies in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, when World War II breaks out, the Dutch get crushed by the Germans pretty quickly. The Dutch colonial army falls very quickly to the Japanese when the Japanese go in uh, to attack a bunch of their colonies. And this leaves a whole bunch of KNIL weapons kind of lying around Southeast Asia. Guns never truly go to waste, and in fact what happened was the country of Indonesia in the 1950s got their hands on a whole bunch of leftover Dutch rifles, uh, rifles and carbines. And Indonesia at the time had a whole bunch of leftover British stuff floating around as well. Indonesia was using the 303 cartridge, and a cool coincidence that they discovered was that the 303 and the 65 Dutch have virtually identical case heads. So much so that you can use both cartridges in the standard Dutch M95 and block clip without any modification or any trouble at all. I know, I've tried it, it works. So what the Indonesians did was they took all of these Dutch turnbolt guns and they rebarreled them into 303 British and then issued them out. They're typically dated 1954 or maybe 1955. And there, there are two main variants of these. There's a, a carbine version, which is kind of the more interesting looking one. Uh, it's a, a short barrel. And, 16 or 18 inches, I think 18 inches, if I remember correctly. And then it's got a big muzzle brake on the end of it, 
and you'll find them sometimes with solid metal butt plates and you'll also find them with the, the rubber butt pads off of number five Enfield carbines. They also had a short rifle version, which is a bit longer, I want to say 22, 24 inch barrel, something like that, with a full length handguard, a, no muzzle brake, and a right, usually a regular flat metal stock, and a two position flip sight. Uh, both of these version, both of these guns are out there. They're definitely underappreciated. Most people don't have any clue that they exist or recognize what they are. And a lot of them are in kind of mediocre condition externally because they're in Indonesia and they got used and abused. Um, they were imported in a huge batch by, I believe, Springfield Sporters back in the 80s. And they sold, but, you know, there, it's not like there's a huge community of Indonesian gun collectors out there. Indonesia didn't have any... They didn't participate in any major world wars. You don't go out and watch Saving Private Ryan and go, hey, there's the Indonesian rifles. So they haven't garnered very much interest, and they're out there for the three to $500 range, typically, depending on condition. So that's, I think that's an excellent example of something that is, it's affordable, it's super unique, it's mechanically interesting because of this conversion they did on it, and it's actually also shootable today. Um, 303 ammo isn't exactly falling out of trees, but it's not difficult to get if you want to get some. So that's one example. Um, a second area where you might take a look are kind of the quasi-modern automatic pistols. If you look at like the birth of the, the double stack, double single action duty pistol, you'll find a, you know, a fair number of interesting guns that didn't really take uh, in the market. And so they're available for not that much money because you know who's gonna pay 600 bucks for a star automatic pistol when I could go get a brand new Glock of any type, pretty much, or a, a Ruger or a Smith & Wesson or anything modern for that kind of money. So you've got guns like the Star 30M, uh, the Star 28M, the 31. Those are all similar um, steel frame, alloy frame, ones a little bit earlier. Uh, those guns competed, for example, against the Beretta in U.S. military trials, and they didn't win, but they were used quite a bit by the Spanish military and Spanish police forces, and they're out there for 300 bucks. I've seen them even cheaper than that. I've seen them in the mid-200s. And, uh, well, another example would be the, the Daewoo DP-51, which I believe is coming back out on the market under the name Lionheart. Uh, it's more or less a, an early, uh, early generation Smith & Wesson automatic, but it's got this interesting, fat, they call it fast action. So it's got regular double and single action, and it also has this feature where you can cock the hammer and then physically push the hammer forward, and what you end up with is a double action length trigger pull that has the weight of a single action pull. Interesting. You know, it, it wasn't revolutionary and tactically excellent enough to get adopted by anyone of huge significance, but they made a bunch of them. Uh, a bunch of those guns got imported. Um, and, and those are also available in the, like the $300 range. So uh, lastly, one other area, if you're looking for something older than that, I would say you could definitely take a look in the, just the whole large realm of European Marshall revolvers. Looking at this, this range from like the 1870s to right about 1900, um, when European militaries were adopting, they were using metallic cartridge guns, you know, modern cartridges basically, although some of them are obsolete cartridges, and they hadn't adopted automatic pistols yet. And so you've got this wide variety of Marshall, pist Marshall revolvers. Uh, the Swiss, the Italians, the British, the Germans, more or less. The Germans less so than anyone else. Um, the Americans. A lot of those guns are out there and, well, for example, the American revolvers are, are pretty well known and they're pretty popular because, of course, they're American and we're in America, so there's a lot of popularity for them. Things like, for example, Italian uh, military revolvers are a vastly underappreciated area. Uh, some of the French revolvers are also underappreciated. And a lot of these guns you can get two to four hundred bucks you know, if you get lucky and find someone who truly doesn't know what they have and don't care, 50 or 100 bucks sometimes can get you an interesting military revolver. Now, the downside of these is that they are typically chambered in cartridges that you can't easily get. Um, the British ones and the American ones are kind of a, uh, an exception to that rule, but if you're looking at French or Italian or German Marshall revolvers, you're looking at some cartridges that are difficult to find outside of hand loading. So... If you're not necessarily interested in, in going out and blasting away with every gun that you get, these things could make an, a really cool base for a collection. Uh, if you are 
wanting to, to get the stuff largely to shoot it, then you know maybe this isn't the best area of interest, or maybe you just focus on some of the ones where you can get the, the ammunition, like the British and the American examples. All right, Robin asks, could I do a well rod review? The answer is yes, at some point I will. I have actually shot a well rod before, a 32 caliber well rod. Uh, didn't have the opportunity to take video of it there, but they're very cool little guns. I know there are some of them floating around, and sooner or later, I will have a chance to do a video on one. From Stephen Birdsall asks, uh, can you tell us about your sources for parts for CNR rifles? Many of us have CNR rifles, but can't find a source for modern stocks. Numeric does their best, but uh, there must be other sources. Uh, this is a tricky question, and it's something that I get asked about a lot. Um, stocks, in particular, are going to be difficult. So I think the reason Stefan is asking about stocks is often, you know, you can find easily and generally cheaply uh, sporterized military rifles, and a lot of people look at those as an opportunity to just get a couple extra parts and rebuild them and have fully functional rifles again in their military configuration. So the problem is, countries didn't typically make a whole lot of stocks. Uh, rifle stocks are bulky, they don't weigh a lot, but they take up a lot of space. They're not something that typically wears out unless you're really in a serious war. So they don't tend to make a ton of spares. A lot of importers aren't going to import a ton of them because, you know, if you're importing a bunch of guns and you have the opportunity to get firing pins with them, well, why not? You know, a little, little package is an awful lot of firing pins. If you're shipping a rifle, you might as well be shipping, or if you're shipping a stock, you might as well be shipping a complete rifle. At any rate, there are not a lot of unmolested military rifle stocks available. Now, that said, they do show up from time to time. Um, often you're probably going to find that it's not worth the cost, no matter how cheap a sporterized rifle is. It's probably economically not going to be, you're not going to come out ahead by restoring it to original configuration. Sometimes, sure, but as a general rule, not a good thing to bet on. Now, as for the sources where I would look for something like that, um, I'll start with Apex Gun Parts. Um, I've worked with them for a long time. They're really cool people, uh, and they have a lot of cool stuff. Uh, they, like pretty much everyone I'm going to list off here, their inventory fluctuates. It's This isn't stuff that's actually being produced today where you can just place an order and get a bunch of it in. Now, most of these companies are going to stock products like that uh, because they are predictable and they, there is a demand for them. But parts for surplus obsolete rifles, it's kind of take what you can get. And someone has to make a judgment call when they're buying of, is there a demand for this part? And is there a demand for this part at the price that I can afford to sell it based on what this person's trying to charge me for it? So you'll find a wide variety of different guns or different parts available. They may or may not be what you need. It's always a matter of, you know, every so often just keep browsing through and see what new stuff people have. Anyway, beyond Apex, um, there is also IMA, International Military Antiques. Uh, Northridge often has stuff. Uh, Liberty Tree Collectors is a com company that uh, hasn't, they've been around for a few years, but they kind of appeared out of nowhere not too long ago, and they have some really cool stuff. Uh, in fact, since you mentioned it, I actually purchased a Berthier carbine stock from Liberty Tree Collectors not too long ago because I have a Berthier with a broken stock. Now, actually, I should say, stock cost me 145 bucks plus shipping. So think about, you know, the $100 Berthier you're buying that's been sporterized, there's, you've now, what, 150% of your cost, you're at 250 with that stock, and that stock does not include things like the nose cap and the, the barrel bands and the handguard. Now, I have those because I simply had a broken stock, but if you're trying to resurrect a sporterized rifle, you're going to need to buy all those parts. You're probably not going to come out financially ahead. You may end up with a cool rifle, and that's awesome. But um, let's see who else. Uh, Stephen Stefan mentioned Numeric. That's e-gunparts.com, and they are the standard primary go-to source for rifle, well, for firearm parts of all types. Sometimes they have surplus stuff. Sometimes they don't. Um, let's see, I wrote down a few of the other companies that I've used. Oh, right, um, BRP Corporation. Actually just ordered some stuff from them as well, uh, Enfield Magazines in particular. Uh, Allegheny Arsenal often has stuff, RTG Parts, and Sarco. So pretty much all of these companies have slightly different specialties, and, and 
for example, RTG parts, I would, would be a go-to source for me for German military, uh, modern German military stuff, uh, H&K parts, MG42 stuff. They seem to have a ton of that. I, they have some connection into that market, I suppose. Anyway, if you play around with these guys' websites and, and check out their inventories repeatedly, you'll get a feel for what types of parts they tend to specialize in. Next question. Christian Haynes asks, say you're an American soldier during World War II, what is the one gun you would most want to come across as a war trophy? So I would say if we discount weird experimental stuff, because there's just a ton of opportunities to find some of that, especially if you're an occupying U.S. soldier at the end of World War II, if we're looking at just stuff that was actually issued on the battlefield, I would have to go with an FG-42. I think that would be about the coolest thing that I would want to come home with as a souvenir. Jan Jacobson asks, have you ever shot with firearms produced in Finland, and what are your thoughts about them? Thinking mostly about oddballs like the Automatic or the Lati L39. Well, Finland is an interesting country when it comes to firearms. Um, they have one major, really prolific domestic arms designer who designed a bunch of the stuff that they used during, well, World War II. <coughs> um, that was Aimo Lati, whose name I probably mispronounced, I apologize. Uh, he came up with the, the Lati pistol was his design. Uh, the 20 millimeter cannon they used was his design. The LS-26 light machine gun was his design. And some of these are good and some of them are bad. And then the other thing that the Finns typically did was use a whole bunch of captured and maybe just reused or maybe re-arsenaled and slightly redesigned captured firearms. Uh, specifically, they used a ton of DP-28 Russian machine guns and uh, most of the Gaunt rifles. In fact, it's interesting, for all of the Mosins that Finland used, they never actually produced a Mosin Nagant receiver. Every single one of them was either captured or purchased from someone else, mostly the Russians. I would say the impressive thing about Finland is not necessarily how great their gun development was, but rather how well they managed to use the guns that they had available. So some of their designs are really good. The, uh, the M39, the, the stereotypical Finnish uh, final version of the Mosin Nagant, is an excellent rifle. It's as good as you could probably possibly get a Mosin Nagant to be, although it is still a Mosin Nagant. Um, the Lottie pistol was quite good, but then some of their guns aren't so good. Um, that 20 millimeter cannon, eh, they're okay. They seem, you know, to often to Americans, they seem like just unbelievably awesome, cool guns because they're huge and and they're like the one 20 millimeter cannon that's actually sort of available we're not that much money uh, in the realm of 20 millimeter cannons. On the other hand, when you compare a Lottie 20 millimeter to some of the other ones out there, uh, most obviously the Solothurn S18-1000, the Lottie is really a much cruder gun and it's a lot less pleasant to use. Um, the LS-26 light machine gun developed by IMO Lottie, they were introduced for World War II, but they turned out to kind of suck. Um, in many ways, they're actually like a modernized show show. Uh, long recoil guns just didn't work well, and they ended up generally being replaced with uh, captured DP-28s. Uh, Finnish submachine guns, the, the K-31 or the M-31, is, are quite good. Uh, they're extremely heavy for submachine guns, but they're reliable and they're accurate. So really, Finland was hit and miss on gun production, but they're pretty much top grade across the board on gun usage. All right, next question. Matisse Enzer says, I'd like to hear about features that have become standard or common, which were originally developed in a garage, in quotes. Uh, perhaps things that compare to how the Magnate or the original Apple computer, which was originally a circuit board without a keyboard or monitor or case, were developed. Um, so I spent some time thinking about this. The one that really jumps to mind, and I think what Matisse is, is curious about here, is to what extent we can actually look at firearms or specific firearms as being really literally the, pro the product of an individual tinkerer working on his own by himself and comes up with this cool idea and it really takes off um, and becomes successful, like Apple computers. Um, and the one example that really jumped out at me of this was actually the Armalite, the AR-15. Now, not the AR-15 specifically itself, but the very first Armalite rifles, literally the AR-1, AR-2, those guys, were in fact made by Eugene Stoner 
on a mill in his garage attached to his home uh, off hours in mornings and evenings. Uh, he put those together actually as hunting rifles or sporting rifles for himself and his wife. And he made this rather innovative use of aluminum for the receivers and came up with this cool design and eventually brought that to Fairchild Aircraft where they evolved into the AR-10 and then the AR-15. So really, that whole line of rifles, what is, I think, by far the most popular rifle in the U.S. today and possibly around the world, maybe with the exception of the AK, was in fact the product of one dude in his garage with a, a lathe and a mill that he bought and just tinkered on by himself. Pretty cool, really. Clayton Ronzo says, or asks, in my opinion, what firearm do I believe would have changed the balance of power in World War I had it been either implemented or implemented properly? Uh, assuming we're talking about small arms, I don't think any firearm would have. Uh, World War I was not primarily a war of small arms. It was a war of logistics and artillery and machine guns. But even more than machine guns, logistics and artillery. And I don't think there's any firearm out there that, that just by putting this better rifle in the hands of the troops could have actually turned the tide of the war. Uh, it just wasn't that kind of war. Colby Gillette asks, why do advanced weapons projects never seem to take off? Is it mainly due to cost or are there other reasons? Such projects like the XM8, the OICW, and even the SPIW project. Um, I would say the problem with advanced research weapons like that is they're typically, the goal with one of those projects is to reach, reach some specific technical objective. And they do that at the cost of general practicality. So, for example, the SPIW project was attempting to develop a technology where you could fire multiple rounds, basically a burst, that would have the same hit probability as a single shot. So the idea is how can we take one projectile and replace it with three, or five even, while keeping the same range, same recoil, the idea being a soldier pulls the trigger once, feels one recoil impulse, but because he's firing multiple projectiles, he has a better chance of actually making a hit. Uh, without this, you know, in an individual shoulder rifle, not a machine gun. And a whole bunch of companies for several decades worked on that project. And the problem is they would always come up with something that would work, but they always, you've got a trifecta of, of, element, of characteristics of one, a gun like this. You've got its durability, you know, how many shots can it actually fire before it just falls apart in your hands. You've got its reliability, how often, assuming it hasn't fallen apart yet, if you pull the trigger, how likely is it to actually work right? And you've got its weight. And you can kind of pick any two of those three if you're on the cutting edge of firearms technology. And you'll see the same thing discussed um, for tanks, for example. You've got speed, armor, and weaponry, and you can kind of pick any two, but you can't have all three. Well, this, this work, that concept works for advanced research firearms. You know, if you want the gun to be really durable and to be very reliable, you can, but it's going to end up being like a 15-pound rifle. And then it's going to get rejected by the military in general because it weighs 15 pounds. You, if you want to make it weigh 8 pounds so that it's a potentially a legit individual combat rifle, that's fine. But it's either going to be unreliable or it's going to fall apart too soon. What makes infantry rifles, what makes a good infantry rifle is that they have been tweaked and uh, perfected long enough to be able to actually get very high grades on all three of those characteristics. Next up from Chris, fluted chambers. I know rifles like the SVT-40 and the HK-91 use them. I know they help with extraction at high pressures. Why don't other designers use fluted chambers? Is there a serious downside to them? What it seems to me is that really the problem with fluted chambers is that they're not truly a solution. They're a fix for an existing problem. So the problem is this rifle is trying to eject when chamber pressure is too high to eject effectively. And if we're looking at something like an HK-91, this is a delayed blowback action. And that's kind of the purpose in the first place is to have it delayed blowback so that it's very simple. There are very few parts. And in that context, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with some sort of remediation for the high pressure because we can't really change the high pressure. We've done our best to make a, a delayed blowback 308 
that is both it's it's light, it's reliable, and it's durable. And the only way we can do that is with this kind of band aid of a fluted chamber. Um, the SVT forty, I believe, was was similar, a little bit different. The SVT was not as refined of a rifle, um, didn't have as much development work that went into it, and the fluted chamber was, again, kind of a crutch. I think in general what a designer would, would much prefer to do is refine the action to the point that it doesn't need a fluted chamber. Because then the gun in general is going to be working better, rather than having this problem of over, overly high extraction pressure, which you can kind of work around with a fluted chamber. Is that a reasonable answer? Um, in my experience, it doesn't really damage the brass. It leaves scorch marks on it, but doesn't really weaken it. Now, HK-91s, which are probably the, by far the most common fluted chamber guns, tend to damage brass in other ways, but not directly from the fluted chambers. So I don't think there's any serious downside to having the chamber fluted. It's just not the ideal solution for the problem that it can solve. Next up. Arno says, I don't see many guns pre-1850 in your videos. Why is that? The answer, Arno, is I just kind of tend to prefer cartridges. Um, especially in my own personal collecting, I like to be able to go out and shoot the stuff that I'm working with, and that's just a lot easier with cartridges. Um, I've done some black powder shooting. I don't mind it. I don't find it as interesting as cartridge guns. So that's why. You will see uh, some black powder pre-1850 stuff from time to time when it's particularly interesting or particularly historically appropriate. But uh, in general, I like cartridges. All right, next question is kind of an amalgamation from something that a number of different people have asked, and that is, what guns are out there that I think ought to be reproduced today? And I would say the answer is two. Um, first off, I would love to see a reproduction of a Schwarzlosa 1898. It's a rotating bolt, short recoil, uh, obviously 1898 pistol design, only a couple thousand of them were originally made. Most of them apparently went to Russia. What's cool about those is they're, they're a pre-1900 gun. They were actually developed in a reasonably powerful, certainly an, an adequately modern, powerful handgun cartridge. They were in uh, 763 Mauser. They were reliable guns and they were very thoughtfully designed and ergonomic guns. They feel good in the hand, they shoot very well, and I think it would be awesome to get reproductions of them. Whether the market will support that? I don't know. Um, clearly not a lot of people, e either all the reproduction companies don't know about them, which is possible, or they don't think that they'd be able to sell enough to actually make a profit on it. So that would be why there hasn't been a reproduction up till now. Um, the other one I think is a better, uh, better shot on the firearms market, and that would be a Burgess pump shotgun. Uh, Andrew Burgess in the late 18, uh, well, eight, in the 1890s, came up with a pump shotgun where the pump handle was actually the trigger guard and a sleeve around the wrist of the gun. So if you're shooting, instead of pumping the gun up here, you're actually pumping it with the, the, the pistol grip. He did that to get around Winchester and Spencer patents, but they're cool guns. Um, that uh, Having the pump on the back half of the gun allowed him to develop a folding version of the gun, which is super cool. And also very rare, uh, they sell for $10,000 plus, which is insane. Um, I think a reproduction Burgess shotgun could actually be quite popular in cowboy action circles. Um, it's a, a cool alternative to the Winchester 1897, and I think it'd be really cool to have one. Um, in fact, I'm a little surprised that none of the Italian companies have reproduced one of those yet. Jensen, with a first name from Norway which I'm not even going to try and pronounce, asks, uh, what do you think of the HK G3? I'm asking because I used one in the Norwegian Army. Uh, well, this may not be what you want to hear, but I really dislike the HK G3. Um, I totally appreciate the technology in it and the mechanics of it, and I really have no interest in shooting them. And in fact, for a full explanation why, I would point you to a video interview I did over with uh, TFB TV, where I spent several minutes talking about that exact subject. From Joe. Joe asks, do I have a day job? What is my background? And how did I accumulate all of my eclectic firearms knowledge? Uh, the answer, we'll start with, uh, I do not have a day job. This is currently what I do full time. And it has been actually for a couple years now, which is fantastic. And I'll point out again, that is especially now largely due to you guys on Patreon helping to support me doing this. Um, 
My background is sort of in engineering. Uh, I have a degree in mechanical engineering technology, not the same thing as pure engineering. Uh, it was kind of a combination of hardcore actual mechanical engineering and machine shop work. So I did things like calculus and I also did things like uh, machining, welding, casting in school. Now I've never really directly used that degree, but eh, that kind of sets a baseline for what my interests have always been. Um, I also have a lot of historical, uh, a lot of historians running in my family. So you put those two together and you get forgotten weapons, I suppose. Um, as for how I acquired all of the weird esoteric firearms knowledge, it came from reading and from listening to people. Um, I spent many, many years hanging around people who knew a lot more than I did and keeping my mouth shut and my ears open and uh, learned an awful lot. I have a, a fairly significant library of reference books that are extremely helpful. Um, a lot of this material, there, there's a lot of stuff you can learn on the internet, especially by finding people on the net who are legitimately expert people. And it can be kind of hard to track down who is and who isn't sometimes, but they are out there. And if you can find them and you ask them questions, you'll, you can learn a ton. Uh, but a lot of this stuff isn't written down. If you want good reference material on firearms, you still have to actually go out and get dead tree printed books because the stuff's, no one's, no one's put all of this material online. Now, part of what I hope to be doing with Forgotten Weapons is fixing that problem to some extent so that even when the books become very rare, a lot of the information is preserved and freely accessible. But that will take quite a lot more time to accomplish. In the meantime, uh, I would say friends who know a lot more than I do, uh, online folks, sometimes friends, sometimes simply uh, people that I have spoken to, and a print reference library. Uh, Eric says, was the 1907 Roth Steyr the first successful striker fired pistol? If not, what was? Um, the 1907 was not. Um, it was one of the earliest cartridge firing, very successful, you know, military adopted striker fired pistols. However, striker firing as a concept predates cartridges entirely. Uh, I would point you to the Dreyse uh, needle pistols, very similar to the Dreyse needle rifles. These were patented in late 1820s. And these are guns where you use a paper cartridge and you literally have a striker needle going through the cartridge to hit the primer. So. Um, I would say Stryker probably began, uh, saw its first use with the first very early cartridges. There's not really a way to have a Stryker fired flintlock. Um, I don't know of any Stryker fired percussion guns, but there may be some out there. It's definitely safe to say that as soon as you have needle fire, which is very early paper cartridges, then you're going to be seeing Stryker fired designs. Was Dreyse the first? I doubt it. Um, I could not put my finger on exactly who would be definitively the first striker fired pistol. All right, and actually our last question. This is from Drew. Drew says, when you travel to auction houses and view their collections, do you di and you disassemble various guns, how do you know the steps involved? Is it from research into that gun or trial and error off camera? Have you ever broken or have you ever been worried about not being have you ever broken one or have you ever been worried about not being able to get something back together? Uh, I would say being able to disassemble them is comes from a variety of sources. Sometimes I actually have original manuals for the guns, even very odd ones. Sometimes I simply have existing experience with those guns. Sometimes it is trial and error. Uh, you know, there are typically only so many ways that a gun can go together. And once you've seen enough of them, you kind of get a feel for, you know, you know, that lever looks like it probably disassembles this bit. And that's very similar to some other design that I've seen before. So often trial and error works. Um, there are guns that either I'm concerned about damaging or guns where they just aren't apparent to me how they come apart. You'll actually see some of those in the coming, uh, coming week or two. I have a series of prototype white rifles that... I poked at, but you know what? I couldn't find an obvious way to get them disassembled and I didn't want to break something or send some spring flying across the room where I would lose it or couldn't be able to get it back together. So I left those things uh, fully intact. Have I ever broken one? No, and I'm very happy of that. Um, I would say that I try to exercise a lot of caution and not do things that might result in broken guns. Um, and have I ever gotten one apart 
and not been able to get it back together? No. Um, I've had one or two that were kind of close calls where I started getting a little bit nervous. Um, every once in a while I have to call someone for advice uh, who knows a particular gun better than I do, but even that's pretty rare. Usually I, if I'm not that confident in the gun, I don't take it apart. So there you go, guys. That was actually quite a lot of questions for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you would like to have your own question added into uh, a list like this for next month, check out my Patreon page. Uh, a $1 a month supporting uh, contribution will really go farther than you think in helping me continue to do this and do it better, uh, travel more, get into collections and museums that are farther and farther from uh, Arizona where I live, and being able to acquire stuff myself so that I can do uh, more significant work with it. Of course, if I'm in a museum or a private collection, I often can't shoot something. If I buy it myself, you can bet that unless it's broken or inoperable, I will be shooting it. So anyway, um, everyone who is a Patreon supporter is always welcome to uh, contribute questions for these monthly Q&A videos. And that's, uh, that's all I got for this month. Thank you guys very much, and tune in again to Forgotten Weapons for all manner of early, unusual, and unique firearms.